Hello and welcome to this uh, s short session. Uh, some of you might be in at the keynote where they talked about the Rockstar interview. Uh, let's see if it's going to be something like that in this talk with Emma Bostian. Please welcome her. I remember the worst technical interview that I ever had. I was living in Austin, Texas, and I was working at IBM. I was looking for new job opportunities. So I took an interview with a startup out of Australia. The recruiter was incredibly nice, and we had a really great conversation. The role sounded great, and I really liked the company mission. But I ultimately ended up withdrawing from the interview process because I could tell, based on the take-home project, that my skills weren't where they needed to be. But the recruiter suggested that we keep in touch, so we did. Over the next several years, we kept in touch. But it was just never the right time for me to make the move to Australia. In 2018, I moved to Germany and accepted a new role at GoToMeeting. The recruiter reached out again and asked if I would be open to a chat, but I had just moved to a new country for a new job, so I wasn't looking to relocate. In 2019, the recruiter contacted me once again, and we scheduled a meeting to discuss job opportunities. The call was scheduled for 6 in the morning German time due to time zone differences. Now, that should have been my first red flag, and I really shouldn't have accepted a meeting at that time. But hindsight is 2020. As soon as the meeting begins, the recruiter says, have we met before? <laughs> Is this guy serious? <laughs> Not only have we been in contact for three years, but he clearly didn't even prepare for this meeting by looking at our history. That was red flag number two. After briefing him on our interview history, he cut me off and said, sorry, my coworker keeps messaging me. Can you just hold on a minute? He has a technical issue. So I sat there in silence while he helped his coworker for the next several minutes. That was red flag number three. <laughs> And when the recruiter had finished helping his coworker, he asked me a question. What's the difference between const and let in JavaScript? OK, red flag number four. I hadn't anticipated this call to be a technical interview. Typically, recruiter phone calls are to get to know each other and learn about the role. If it was going to be a technical interview, I should have been informed. I was caught off guard, but I decided to answer the question anyway. Variables declared with const can't be reassigned, while variables de declared with let can, I stated. Mm, no, that's not really correct, he said, which it was, by the way, it was correct. <laughs> but he moved on to the next trivia-style question. After the interview, the recruiter emailed me and asked if I'd like to proceed to the next stage. I told him I was no longer interested in continuing the process, and I did. I explained why. But that interview took place three years ago, and I still think about it. If candidates have a terrible interview experience, they'll remember it for the rest of their lives, and they will actively advise others not to interview with you. So today I'm going to share with you five guidelines to improve your interview process in the hopes that every single candidate that comes through your pipeline has a great experience, regardless of whether they get an offer or not. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Emma Bastian. I'm a software engineer at Spotify. I spent the better part of my career studying the technical interview process. I failed a lot of interviews, but I've also passed a great deal as well. I'm currently on the interview working group at Spotify, and I've also published an ebook about how to nail a technical interview, but from the interviewee perspective. Today, we're focusing on the interviewer perspective. So let's talk about these five tips for improving your process. So the first tip is to use the interview as a teaching opportunity. I always begin my interviews by saying, I want today to function less like an interview and more like pair programming. If you get stuck, feel free to ask questions. I'm here to help you. Here's one way that we can put this into practice. Let's say that you've asked a candidate to pull information from a blog post URL. This is the structure of the URL. So we've got our domain and our TLD, we've got our slug, and then we've got the post permalink. We want them to return the blog post name and title case. And I'm going to warn you right now, this is all in HTML and CSS and JavaScript, but it's, it's slightly relevant to the talk, so it's OK. Just go with it. So let's say that this is the solution that they provide. Their method of accessing the data is going to work just fine. 
but it can be optimized by using array destructuring. So I might say, yeah, your solution looks great. There are a few small improvements that we can make to reduce the amount of code while we maintain readability. Are you familiar with array destructuring? If the candidate says yes, that's awesome. Let them refactor their solution. If they're not, I'll say, why don't you take a minute to look up the documentation to see if we can refactor this code? If the candidate is still struggling to implement array destructuring, I'll refactor the solution with them. Uh, and I'll explain, array destructuring lets us pull information out of an array and assign it to a variable. So we can reduce our three lines of assignments to just one line. Let's look at another example. So you've asked an HTML and CSS question, and you want the candidate to build this provided mockup of two buttons. So here's a code. They have two button classes, button one and button two. And it's probably a little hard to see, but if you notice, there's a lot of repeated CSS. So padding, font size, and height are all repeated. I might say, it seems like we've got a lot of overlapping styles. Is there a way we can refactor this to be more efficient? So after some rework, this is the new solution that they've provided. They've created a top-level button class that has all the repeated styles for the two buttons, and then they have button one and button two for the individual styles. Awesome, their code is much more succinct. Now I might ask, is there a way that we can make our CSS class names more semantic? Button one and button two don't really tell us much about that button's purpose. If the candidate gets stuck and they're not sure how to proceed, I might say, have you heard of any CSS naming architectures like block element modifier? If they say yes, I'll ask them to use it to name the buttons semantically. But if they say no, I'll just show them. So we can keep our overarching button class as the block, and we can use the modifier that you see here on 12 and 17 to kind of create the semantic relationship. So we know what the, uh, the block element is the button, and the modifier is primary or secondary. When we use the technical interview to learn together, everyone walks away happier, regardless of the outcome. Interviews are supposed to gauge how candidates think, but many fail to accurately assess this. One way to understand a candidate's thought process is to ask questions. Um, now, this may seem intuiti intuitive, and you're probably thinking, yeah, that's the whole point of an interview, <laughs> and you're not wrong. But I see many interviewers fail to ask the right questions. I like to think of these questions like bumpers or guardrails along a bowling alley. You might need them. They're there to guide a candidate to an optimal and working solution if needed but you also might not need them. The first question you might need to ask is, where are you stuck? It's common for candidates to get stuck or feel overwhelmed. They may be sitting in silence trying to figure out where to go, and we don't want them to become anxious or to shut down. But the key to asking this question is to give them a moment of time to process their thoughts before you jump in. There's a great parenting book called Bringing Up Baby. It's written by an American woman, Pamela Druckerman, and she's living in Paris, raising a family. And you're probably asking yourself, why is she talking about a parenting book at a tech conference? Well, there's a concept called the pause in France that we can apply to tech interviews. So I come from the US, it's very common there. If your baby is crying, you immediately run and you pick them up and ask if everything's okay. It seems intuitive, if your baby is crying, you should be there to help them. But as a result, many American babies struggle to establish a good sleep schedule. In contrast, French parents practice the pause, where they wait a moment when their baby starts crying. And just by pausing for those few moments before you check on your baby or picking them up, you're allowing them to learn how to self-soothe and sort it out on their own. So we can use this approach with technical interviews as well. Before jumping in to help a candidate, when you see them struggling, just pause for a moment. Give them some time to process their thoughts, and if the pause becomes too long at that point, um, when you can see them getting visibly frustrated, you can ask, where are you stuck? Other questions we can use to guide the interview in the right direction are, why did you do this? Is there a way that we can make this more performant? I see we have a lot of duplicate code. Can we condense it? Asking questions provides the interviewee with the opportunity to optimize their solution and showcase some of their skills. <laughs> 
It's no secret that tech interviews get a bad reputation, and it's primarily attributed to the fact that the questions we're asking during the interview are pretty irrelevant to the job at hand. And typically, they focus pretty heavily on computer science concepts. Suppose that you're interviewing for a food delivery application like Foodora or Uber Eats. The first question asks the candidate, given an array of integers, sort the array in ascending numerical order. Okay, hold on a second. What does sorting an array of integers have to do with being a developer on a food delivery app? Instead, we can create a practical question that examines a candidate's ability to create a sorting algorithm. Instead, we can say, you're building a feature that allows customers to, store, to sort a restaurant's food from least to most expensive. How would you implement this, given an array of objects where each object represents a dish and contains a name and a price? So both questions are examining a candidate's ability to implement a sorting algorithm, but one is completely irrelevant, and the second is something a candidate might have to do in their day job. So this is one example of how you can turn sorting algorithms into practical questions. But what about those trivia-style questions? Suppose that you're, uh, the position you're interviewing for requires a strong knowledge of CSS. Instead of asking them what's the definition of CSS specificity, let's make it practical you can instead have a problem like this. So given the following code snippet, explain why the pink box is not pink and fix it. Well, if we look at the code, the style is not being applied because of the container box direct descendant selector, that's a mouthful, on line nine. It's more specific, and it's setting the background color to blue. So we can either remove the direct descendant selector or add a class of box to the pink selector to make it more specific. And of course, there are other ways, like adding inline styles or important, but these solutions aren't optimal. This question allows us to evaluate a candidate's knowledge around CSS specificity and whether they're able or whether they understand how to calculate these values, but we do it without asking these trivia questions. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Allow candidates to Google things in their interview. Tech interviews suck, as it is. They're artificial. Um, we don't need to force candidates to memorize whether it's a ray dot splice or a ray dot slice. Uh, so allowing candidates to Google is going to do two things. One, it puts them more at ease. They don't have to memorize all the APIs on the internet. But two, it's actually going to allow us to see how they search for things that they don't know, and that's really important in our jobs. Allowing candidates to Google will not give them a solution to the problem we're asking, and if it does, it be a little obvious. Instead, it's going to give them the tools they need to create a successful solution. It's really win-win. And the last tip to improve your tech interviews is to have two interviewers. Now, I know some of you are thinking, doesn't having two interviewers make the candidate more anxious? It might, honestly. But by having two interviewers, we're reducing the possibility of unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is something that we all have, and unless we're aware of it, can influence the way that we're evaluating our candidates. It's the social stereotypes that we form about groups of people outside of our own awareness. I remember the first time I explicitly encountered my own unconscious bias. My colleague and I were evaluating a young woman for a web developer position. After the interview, I said to my colleague, she reminds me of myself when I was looking for my first job out of college. And my colleague looked at me and said, that's your unconscious bias. You need to check that before you provide your feedback. And she was right. I was unconsciously empathizing with this candidate, even though she didn't perform that great, just because she reminded me of myself. So how do you run an interview with two interviewers? One interview will lead the interview, while the other will either shadow or support. And it's always good for the lead interviewer to make space for their co-interviewer to ask questions. So before moving on to a new section, I'll say, hey, co-interviewer, do you have any questions or comments before we move on? After the interview, each interviewer submits feedback in isolation, and only after each person has submitted their feedback should they reconvene and discuss how the interview went. So debriefing with a co-interviewer is really important because it does two things. It allows us to gauge whether our evaluations were too lenient or too harsh, but it's also an opportunity to get feedback on how you interview candidates and if there are areas that you can improve upon. So today we've taken a look at just five tips you can implement to improve your process. Tech interviews are hard to get right. 
but we as an industry have an opportunity and an obligation to make them as practical as possible. I think I talked really fast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, are there any questions? Could you show the last picture? Yeah. Also, sorry for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I hope it was challenging for some of you. <laughs> cool. Yeah, thank Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, one question? I usually start crying with them. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, I sure. Any thoughts on um, stakeholder assignments versus uh, live Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, any thoughts on take-home projects versus live coding? Um, I love take-home projects for me personally because it takes the stress off of it and allows me to focus my best skills using my tools. However, that's coming from a place of privilege because well, now I have a baby, she's over there. But um, at the time, you know, I was a single 20-something year old. I had the free time. So for many people, they're not interviewing for fun, they're also working full-time jobs, or they've been laid off and they need a job now, and they don't have the spare time. You know, they have children, they have elderly parents to take care of. Um, I love giving an option. I, I suggest giving an option of either do a take-home or do like some on-site live coding because they work for different purposes. And also, if you can pay your candidates for their time and effort, please do that. Don't make them solve your code bugs unless you're paying them, or just don't do it at all, because that's not ethical. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.